Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome back to not another one of these, uh, just a, a supercut of the David Vice video uh, interview that he did with was it ZTV or Z Media, something along those lines. Some Australian girl who girl woman who sells a uh, you know survivalist garbage and what have you. Um, things are a bit a bit quiet lately around here. Um, few well, no particular reason I'm going to go into in public. I've got some stuff going on personally, but I won't bore you with. Um, quick health update, I've been given the all clear on my throat, even though I do have a massive sore throat. I had something called leukoplakia on some on one of my vocal cords. Um and I had the I, I did the most stupid thing, I googled leuko leuko leukoplakia. Um I can't even say it now. Um and all the results terrified me. So it's Never Google your symptoms of hiding to nothing and fatal. Uh, right, so I'm, what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to uh, put together the last four videos I did of the David Weiss interview he did with Z Media, where basically I managed to debunk everything he was saying every step of the way. I got to halfway through that interview. Um, I could not carry on. He went on about um, flight paths some more, which he got completely wrong massively misrepresented the the actual flight paths on his little stupid map um, to make it fill his narrative so to speak he went on about uh, how the sun illuminates the the earth without explaining how it doesn't illuminate parts of the earth when it's supposed to that kind of thing <clears throat> if one day in the future I get around to doing the other half of the video I will but frankly I try to start doing it again and it just frazzled my brain I could not physically and mentally continue because I th think I was going to hurt something physically and mentally oh my god look at the bunnies they're so gorgeous uh, so the, the rabbits are just doing a yin yang thing it's really quite cute uh, when they're not trying to kill each other um, so please sit back enjoy if you haven't seen them already the hour and 20 or so minutes I managed to cobble together and witnessed the miracle of not one but two costume changes and a rapidly diminishing haircut. I know I need to get this sorted out, I do apologise. So I may or may not see you at the end, if I do, I'll see you there. We're joined now by David Weiss, also known as Flat Earth Dave. He's been on a mission for many, many years to prove to the world that the Earth is flat. Now, let me just uh, say openly that I am completely undecided here. What I do know is that I don't trust the globalists and I don't trust NASA. So well, that's not exactly what you'd call an impartial interviewer. Open to the idea means you're already biased one way or the other. Um... There's nothing to be by. There's no no middle of the road here. The Earth's a globe, um, scientifically verifiable. Um, what's the word? Demonst demonstrably real. That's the expression I'm looking for. Um, doesn't believe the globalists and doesn't believe NASA. This is not journalism in any way, shape, or form. And we're less than thirty seconds in. <sighs> this is going to be fun. But today we're going to explore this topic. David, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me on, Maria. I really appreciate speaking to people that have open minds and are brave enough to look at this very taboo topic. It's the fact that, you know, when you mention, you can mention fairies and goblins and whatever you want. Everyone's like, oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. And then you mentioned Flat Earth and they're like, get out of here. Get out of here because of the programming. So the fact that you're willing to address it, uh, the truth does not fear investigation. And here we are. Let's talk about it. So, yeah, the statement, the truth does not fear investigation. No, it doesn't, and it never has. It just depends on your understanding of what truth is and how much you're willing to accept, because you just aren't. That you were actually uh, staunchly against it at one point. Well, every flat earther was staunchly against it. We were all, we're all brought up and indoctrinated into believing, you know, this heliocentric uh, Disney uh, crazy, insane solar system. Here's the thing. People that believe in the globe, they have no idea what they believe in. We'll get into that, right? Because they, they think they know, but when you actually look at it, that's how you become a flat earther. So I was doing a, a conspiracy podcast. When I say conspiracies, I mean where people are conspiring to benefit themselves. That's called a conspiracy. And a lot of that goes on in this world. So I was doing this podcast about all these things, and people started throwing flat earth at me. And I'm like, nope, 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 not going to look at it, not going to look at it, because I was programmed like flat earth, dumbest thing ever. 
thing about that is, if you were already talking about, openly talking about various conspiracies with that incorrect description you just gave of it, um, it's not about some somebody or some organisation profiting. It's a set of beliefs that people have that go against the norm, of which there is no evidence. That's why it's called a conspiracy. Um, I do not believe for one second that David Vice has ever been against Flat Earth or shied it away. He's an absolute sponge for garbage. So, so far, he's already talking out of his backside, which was to be expected. Obama said, you know, in six different speeches, we don't have time for a meeting of the Flat Earth Society. And so he should. He was the president of the United States, probably one of the best ones they've had. Well, given what we've had since, he's absolutely the best president you've had in quite some time. Um, why would you give any time to discussing Flat Earth when, again, said so many times before, it's not bloody flat, there's no reason to discuss it. You can talk about it and say, OK, you're saying the Earth is flat. Here's a live stream from the ISS that shows it isn't flat. Here is uh, pictorial evidence. Here is, you know, Aristosthenes evidence from thousands of years ago who proved beyond a reasonable doubt that the Earth is an oblate spheroid and it is not flat. Um, with a Wikipedia link that always gets put underneath these, uh, these videos of these ilk. Um, the concept of flat earth is an archaic uh, concept of the shape of the earth. It's been disproved. You may as well ask Obama to talk about leprechauns. That's how they do it. I I was completely against it. Wouldn't look at it. But then a uh, a uh, another researcher I trust very much, uh, Sophia Smallstorm. Um, Sophia Smallstorm is um, an absolute crackpot. Um, she is a COVID denier, COVID vaccine, anti-vaxxer, 9-11 conspiracy theorist, 5G conspiracy theorist. Um, absolutely no, no, um, no person whatsoever to be able to lead anybody anywhere. And as I said, if he's willing to believe anything this person says, then he was always going to accept flat earth concept. His claim that he shied it away don't believe it for a second. She made me look. She's like, Dave, you got to look. And she sent me Mark Sargent's clues, which uh, Mark Sargent put out some. Um, he came across Flat Earth. He's like, wait a minute. Let me just put some short videos together asking questions. He figured some astrophysicist would come back and go, look, this is this is an explanation. Silence, crickets, nothing. This um, probably I'm doing well here. Um, this probably relates to that video from the Flat Earth conference where Mark Sargent claimed he sent five seconds, five questions to a university um, asking about the shape of the earth and this and the other. I'll see if I can dig the clip up. Um, but basically, he said that he asked this question to a university, there was no response. I asked this question to a university, there was no response. Like helium, hydrogen, and fluorocarbons, isn't it more logical to suggest the atmosphere is being contained in an enclosed pressurized system? They had no answer. Very good reason for that. You're not worth the time of day. Um, your questions are a complete waste of resources, time and energy. They've got more important things to be doing than asking stupid questions from an idiot. By the way, Mark Sargent, very, very quickly falling out of favour with the Flat Earth community. Um, I don't normally side with him. Level Earth Observer very recently did a partially excellent video about Mark Sargent um, selling his soul to an Australian betting app. Um, Adam, Elio, Adam um, looked the app up, or looked up the which country has the worst record for gambling addiction. You know, it's Australia. Flat Earth expert Mark Sargent thinks the moon landing was a hoax. Technically, the moon itself is a hoax. Right, but betting with Sportsbet's new iPhone app? I could do this standing on my head. Thanks, gravity. Sportsbet's new iPhone. What are you thinking? Technically, the moon is a hoax. Are you for real? And Mark Sargent's advertising an Australian gambling app. So, yeah. Um, but then again, he's an attention-seeking liar who charges people to go to his conferences, says everything you need to say about this Sophia Smallstorm and Mark Sargent. So, yeah. Still, let's crack on. And so I watched that and I'm like, okay, I'm not going to just believe anything. And I started looking and the thing that got me was um, ships over the horizon. Everyone goes, what about ships disappearing from the bottom up? 
But then please see my previous video for Evanus with this. He's gonna talk about buying an expensive camera, isn't he? He's gonna talk about getting an expensive camera and zooming on a boat or something on the water and bringing it back into into view. And with today's super zoom cameras and optics, we can zoom in and bring those ships right back into view when they supposedly went behind a physical curve, right? Right. If, um, if my mouth is behind this physical curve, zooming in isn't gonna do anything. But on a flat earth, the horizon is optical. And so I went out and bought a thousand dollars worth of camera equipment, tripods, went down to the beach, zoomed in on a buoy that was 11 miles away, just over 10 miles. At 10 miles, according to the globe map, there should be 66 feet of curvature, 66 feet. How am I seeing this buoy? Um, let's see the photo. If you had a camera, you spent thousands of dollars on a camera, um, you don't tell me you just took it down there to zoom in on the horizon on boats. That's a colossal waste of money. Let's see the po let's see the pictures, Dave. And I said, I know it, I know it. The the curvature calculator is wrong. So I went to the debunking sites, the sites that are put out there to steer people away from flat earth. I was like, what are they saying the curvature should be? Where's the picture? You took a camera to the beach and you didn't take a picture with which you could prove what you said was true. And they have this ridiculous um, calculator that says, oh, well, you're sharing the hump with, you know, the, the drop with the viewer. So it's only half of that. I'm like, okay, that doesn't make any sense, but I'll go with it. 33 feet. I don't know any buoys that are 33 feet tall. Okay. I'm still seeing this buoy. And not only can I see the buoy, I can see the surface of the water for miles and miles and miles beyond it. As I said before, what's a good demonstration? Haven't really got anything, but let's just say, get my camera up so I can see what I'm seeing. So let's say, that's the beach. That's the horizon. Okay, you see that? That is actually my um, serious black wand box. There you go. Uh, so there's the horizon. It does not just go to a point and stop, and then it goes off level or whatever. It goes. It's a gradient. I'm not going to bend my box, but when you're looking at the horizon, your eyes are drawn to the horizon, and depending on your height. Um, you are actually inadvertently looking down to the horizon if you're up on a cliff or a hill or something along those lines. You're just drawn to it. But because it's so far away, you perceive it to be still at a level. Um, David Keegan, the other day, brilliant video, which he referenced another video where somebody made a U-shaped spirit level with water that he took down to the beach and it was in line with the... Um, the horizon took it up onto a hill and it was way above because obviously the higher you are the further down the horizon is it's just very hard to perceive because our eyes are drawn to it but yeah you can actually see quite far i mean if you're standing right on the beach i think i can't remember where i saw it it might actually have been on an episode of qi you can only see about six or seven miles um but it's curving away from you gradually so it's very possible he saw the buoy um, and brought it back in with an amazingly high-powered camera of which he has no, he has not provided any evidence he either owns or knows how to use because he hasn't shown any pictures. Again, I'm going to go back to my reference of Folkestone, Folkestone in France, which I live very close to. I've said it before a couple of times. You can see France from Folkestone, you can't see from Dungeness. It's only a difference, a perpendicular difference of about 20 miles straight down the coast. Yes, my evidence of the curvature of the Earth is 25 miles that way that way i went in to debunk flat earth with a closed mind i'm here to debunk flat earth and prove the globe that's not real that's not the way you should do investigate anything True. i went in with that attitude and um that's how you become a flat earther only when you look <laughs> only when you take the time and look that's how you become um a flat earther no you become a flat earther by having preconceived biases that you need to validate by um only f looking at the things you want to look at as I said before, I'm literally, I'm only five or six minutes into this video, um, and I'll probably double the runtime of this bloody thing. Um, everything he's saying is completely disingenuous. He is absolutely a conspiracy theorist, absolutely willing to accept the concept of a flat earth. If he had any kind of capability of objectively analysing evidence as presented to him, he would not be a flat earther. Flat earthers cannot accept contradictory information to previously held beliefs schizotypy once again yeah you know people say have you ever flown in an airplane you can see curvature um you can't see curvature right and every time we prove that you can't see curvature at a certain elevation they move the globe post right 
instead of the goal post, they moved the globe post farther. We're like, we proved that you can't see it at um, out of an airplane. So then Neil deGrasse Tyson comes out and says, oh, you have to be in a jet fighter at 70,000 feet. So the Mythbusters, right, the, the disinformation guys I call the Mythbusters, they, they showed it at, at 70,000 feet. Oh, look at the curve. And they're filming through curved glass with a fisheye lens. Yes. But one of the cameras inside that was looking out the back did not have a fisheye lens. And it right. could see the horizon at camera level, right? I personally haven't seen, I've never really watched Mythbusters, um, all this thing about Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, I do know that MC Toons very recently um, called out Mark Sargent once again, who said he would quit Flat Earth if anyone would, could provide... Um, photographic evidence of the curvature of the Earth, um, and they have done. Um, <clears throat> now, what they say about not being able to see the curvature of the Earth from an airplane window, an airplane window is about that wide, and because of our focal range, unless we shove our face right up against it, we really can't, not really. Um, Mark Sargent, God, there are all these names I'm throwing around here. Mark Sargent was invited on this morning when Phil and Holly were still doing it together. Um, I think I've clipped it before. Um, and he, Philip Schofield said that he'd been on Concord many years ago and he'd seen the curvature of the Earth in the window because that, obviously, because it can go much faster, it can go much higher. And then both, Holly said, so is Phil a liar? Mark Sargent says, no, he just wanted to see a curvature. It's not about want, it's about what you can. If I want to see a curve and there isn't one there, I'm not going to invent one in my mind. I'm pretty sure this is pretty finely tuned. I can tell the difference. Um, I'm actually, because of my job, I'm actually quite good at it. Um, ask me about my timber, um, lumber, whatever you want to call it. Um, so yeah, this is about the curvature of the earth being able to, there is a certain threshold where you have to get to a certain height before you can see the curvature of the earth with the naked eye. Fisheye lenses, um, fisheye lenses is the curse of the GoPro. The GoPro is a, you know what it is, it's a very light, portable, multi-use camera that tends to come with a fisheye lens because it wants to get as much information in as possible, which is going to be, be semi-manipulated editing software later. Um, but the default video format is slightly fisheye. The Felix Baumgartner video is a prime example of that. However, plenty of people have taken non-fisheye lens cameras up into the atmosphere, stratosphere, whatever, taking a picture of the horizon, and it is very, very obviously curved. Take a look at the 50, 50 minute ISS video when they go into the now infamous Coppola scene, um, curve to the earth right there. The curve to the earth is there. You don't have to want to see it if it's there to be observed. Okay, so here's a shot. Now, when you try to look across the land from ground level, close to ground level, the air is the thickest. You also have topographical you know, um, fluctuations in the land, and there's going to be something that's above your eye level that's going to stop you from seeing any farther, and that's going to be your horizon, the, the whatever is above your eye level. I just want to quickly stop here. He's more than capable of showing photos behind him in his off-to-the-side green screen. Where's the picture of the boy that you took a photo of 11 miles away? You had a camera on the beach. Did you not have a, any film? You did not have a memory card? All right. But well, from the top of a mountain where the air is clear, you can see much farther. And we can see all of these mountains, okay? Um, all, of the, all of these mountains here. And there's uh, what is it, seven, seven mountains. And they're over 700 miles away. According to the Guinness Book of World Records, the longest distance ever photographed from a point on land to another point on land is 275 miles. It was taken in 2016. Um, this photo he's showing here, I have no idea what he's talking about. Hello, Editing P here. I just want to quickly interject that I've done a little bit more research into this picture um, and it's still a little bit ambiguous. The picture by, apparently was taken by a photographer named Andrew Bailey. Um, it was from the top of Mount Snowdon. In Wales um, but the, apparently the mountains in the distance you can see are supposed to be the Alps um, you know south of France apart from there only being one set of circumstances where it would be possible to see the Alps from Snowdon given refraction indexes and whatnot um, somebody did a lot more thorough investigation into this picture and for lack of a better expression they're not mountains in the distance they're clouds um, if I can, I'll post the links to another video which is on a, a, a channel connected to uh, Dave Weiss or David Weiss. 
um, where a guy explains what he thinks he's seeing and he compares it to a side-by-side -side comparison of Mont Blanc, uh, even though Mont Blanc is probably at a completely different angle from if you were able to view it from Snowden. But as I said previously, um, the photo doesn't show what they think it does, but it's, it's like the black swan. They think it's their actual proof. As I said before, Guinness Book of Records, 275 miles in a straight line, is the longest distance ever photographed from land. You know what mainstream science says about this photo? What? Nothing. They won't address it. They won't address it. But this is something that anybody, you know, can go and do. You know, take a trip, go go to a mountain, and go to this mountain exactly, and, and go take the photo yourself. If you're willing to take a trip, come down to Folkestone, have a look at France, and then go down to the beach and try and have another look at one. Best of luck to you. Could this be explained through perception? perception or refraction are you trying to say uh just the angle that you're from because i know that the further away you are it uh, you know you explain this far better than i do but things will appear at different levels different sizes right as things go into the distance they get smaller and smaller and smaller due to perspective yes now the globe people will say well when something's over the curve it refracts up it refracts up Things do get wobbly. When you look into the distance, they do refract. You can get mirages. You can get reflections. But when something is blocked, hidden behind something, it doesn't refract up into your vision and magically stop at eye level. Yeah. That's that's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, yes, it does, and this has been proven. Uh, I cite the famous black swan photograph, which for the longest time was supposed to be the absolute definitive proof of a flat earth. But as he says, things were wibbly wobbly, timey wimey, spacey wacy. Um, somebody took a later photo of exactly the same thing. It's quite obviously massive, massive amounts of refraction. We do a thing called um, a mirror flash because right? sometimes we do laser beams, you know, across frozen lakes and stuff. And the globalist argument is, you know, the laser beam is shooting up over the curve, and you're just seeing the beam. Yes, right? I've heard. Now, that. That's a hor that's a horrible argument, but I'll give it to him. You know. What? It's quite telling that the only thing he's got to demonstrate all of his theories about straight lines across lakes and whatever is a tiny, tiny inflatable globe he's able to hold in his hand. I've absolutely no doubt whatsoever that this is deliberate. Um, I don't think he's that smart, but I think it's just what he had to hand. However, he's trying to demonstrate things that can be seen on a gigantic planet on a tiny ball. He's not the only one to use these misleading methods, these deliberately misleading methods uh, to try and sway things to his argument. Um, but it, yeah, so get a larger ball, make yourself smaller. When you're talking about an amoeba on a basketball, you're absolutely right, you are too small um, and a little bit too insignificant, which I think is the more important word. They don't like being insignificant, these people. Uh, let's carry on. People think that they're superhuman, that they're supermen, that their eyes can see forever. Well, how come I can't see across the ocean from New York to, to the, Europe? Well, because of air thickness, uh, uh, you know, pollution, not, not just pollution, air, you know, uh, moisture and just diminishing light. You can't see that far. And what the heck is in Europe that's big enough for you to see? Probably a boy in the middle of the ocean. Just try looking at that first. Now, I heard this one, I think this was in the, the, um, the larger video I did, about, oh, there's mist and there's haze and there's pollution. 26 miles. That's all I'm asking you to look at. 26 miles across the English Channel. Use a zoom on your magically expensive camera and bring France back over the horizon. Bet you can't. Let's start with the heliocentric model. Let's start with that, because I've yeah. seen you explain uh that model uh, just like the other side would do and just go straight to debunking i'd like you to debunk the heliocentric model okay so the heliocentric system uh, model makes a lot of claims they make a lot of claims that we are a well first you go back to creation once upon a time there was nothing it exploded and became everything that's yeah. a cool story it was a mass expansion not an explosion no one ever said it actually exploded. The Big Bang is a misnomer. It was just a term they used at the time. There wasn't nothing. There was something. And at the best guess of science, which I've spoken about before, it expanded suddenly and it's still expanding. And then all of the rocks, they stuck together and they turned into perfect balls that started spinning. And then all of the gases somehow 
collided, it came together and became so massive that they sucked in more gases and they left a void, a vacuum in between. You ever hear the term nature ab abhors a vacuum? Nature doesn't like vacuums. Air, you know, gases will fill the available space. How do you have burning balls of gas in a space vacuum? It doesn't make any sense. How do you have air on a, you know, we're a rock surrounded with water, surrounded with air adjacent to no pressure space, a vacuum, right? Yes. We have a, um, uh, the NASA has a, uh, um, a vacuum chamber here and the walls are like six to 10 feet thick of concrete and steel. So it doesn't implode. Right. Okay. I, I was going to say oh, we're, we're back to level Earth observer territory, but not quite. Um, Adam believes that there should be a solid separation between the atmosphere of the Earth and the vacuum of space because he believes that a vacuum sucks. Well, a vacuum doesn't suck. It's just an empty void of nothing. Obviously, our, the atmospheric system we have on the planet is a gradual system. Air gets thinner the further out you go. Um, it doesn't completely stop. Our atmosphere has been, traces of our atmosphere have been seen out as far as the Earth's moon. Uh, that's why it said that we've never escaped the Earth. Even though we've stepped on the moon, we've walked on the moon, we've never escaped the Earth's atmosphere. Now, obviously, the Earth's atmosphere is a kind of pressure system, but down here at this level, he talks about a vacuum chamber at NASA. Yeah, probably. Um, yeah, you would have to have steel doors and massive bits of concrete because you're within our atmosphere, sucking everything out of there. And you're right, nature abhors a vacuum and the atmosphere would want to kind of get back in there. That's the point. Um, it's a massive feat of engineering to make these vacuum chambers on the scale that NASA uses anyway. I believe they're using to, to simulate like a, the moon environment, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, having a vacuum in space where there is nothing is not the same as having a vacuum down here. Having a vacuum at ground level is a completely different kettle of fish altogether. Yes, and if it wasn't manufactured properly, it would implode. Because you said it, nature abhors a vacuum. All the atmosphere around would try to occupy every, all available space. Because this vacuum has been artificially created within the Earth's atmosphere, it is a completely different concept to the atmosphere of space, and it's a disingenuous misdirection to compare the two as being the same thing. They're not. But we have this space station out there, right? With it, it just made out of aluminum, you know, astronauts go out there in their snowboarding suits. They don't explode like the Michelin Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. I mean, they would just explode from the, the difference in pressure. Okay. So how do you have high pressure adjacent to a void without a container? It's never been shown that you can do that. Never. I take it back. That's exactly what Level Earth Observer says. Um, I do apologize. Uh, all credit to Adam there. Um, yeah, so as I've explained, they don't understand the fact that gravity is keeping our atmosphere on the planet. It's not perfect. Some of it leaks into space. It goes out quite some way. doesn't need to be a physical barrier because gravity is doing that for you. Vacuums do not mean vacuum cleaners. Space doesn't suck. Gravity can hold down the air, but I could drink through a straw and suck water and air up and away from gravity with the weak, low pressure of my mouth and lungs. Gravity is actually quite weak. Um, it's a constant, was it nine meters per second per second? Um, you sucking a drink for a straw with the suction of your mouth, yeah, you can, you can break. If we couldn't break gravity, we couldn't jump. Uh, we'd hardly be able to walk because it would be pinned to the ground all the time. Of course, we can defy gravity. Of course, we can defy gravity. We just can't stay up there. What do you expect us to float? What goes up must come down. When you finish sucking on your straw, what happens to the rest of the water in the straw? goes back into the glass that's gravity you you're, what you're doing is really um un um unwiring the teaching from school for example everything that we were taught in these institutions which are indoctrination centers were essentially to get us prepared for uh, globalism tell me again how you're biased without actually telling me you're completely biased i don't like this person because she tries to say she's open-minded she clearly isn't and now they're going on to the education system where everybody's being indoctrinated. No, they bloody aren't. We're being taught stuff. I remember my school days quite well. And I remember my science lessons quite well. We, we were given four, four or five. I was trying to remember this the other day. It's hypothesis, method, um, practice, results, hypothesis, or something along those lines. There was a four or five stages. So you had the idea, you got the equipment, you 
formulated the experiment, you did the experiment, you posted your results, then you came to your conclusion. So your hypothesis, methods, results, conclusion, etc. Um, you found any experiments yourself. Your science teacher, my science teacher said, right, do this, do this, do this, let us know what happens. We weren't told what to expect, we found these things out ourselves. And it's the same with most facets of science. Nobody goes into a science lab or a, um, a science research lab saying, right, today I'm going to find X, Y, Z and I'm going to use ABC to do it. And if I don't get to X, Y, Z, I'm going to completely, I'm going to redo all my experiments until I do get X, Y, Z. That's not how science works and that's not how research works and that's not how evidence or investigation works. If the old adage of doing your own research, but you're not finding anything new. You're not finding anything you haven't already known or pr thought you've known or presupposed before. Like my uh, my recent experience we find out about maps, that east used to be north, so to speak. That was fascinating to me because I did generally did know that. I'm 50 years old. I found out something new. I've absorbed it into my current knowledge base, and it's now a fact for me. These people cannot, as I said before, accept anything that is contradictory to their previously previously conceived beliefs. Any contradictory information is completely disregarded because it goes against their current view and they can't take it in. I'm continually attacking educational establishments when all they're doing is teaching established facts with verifiable sources is again muddying the well. I don't know if these guys have got kids, but do they honestly go off their, take their kids off to school? So there you go. Don't listen to anything they've got to say. Just sit down for six or seven hours. Come home and I'll tell you all about the real facts of the world that I've got out of this YouTube page and this Facebook group. That's the real, that's the real facts. And I know it's the real facts because Mark Sargent and Eric DeBase said so. Okay, so the, the, the theory of how the earth is spinning. Talk to us about, and I'm calling it a theory on purpose, talk to us about how they present that versus what you actually believe. Okay, we've spoken about theories before. Completely wrong um, to use it in this concept. There's no theory of the earth spinning. It's not like relativity or gravity or evolution, anything like that. It's, a, it's beyond the theory, the fact that the earth is rotating, not spinning. Um, so yeah, this is just an absolute disingenuous hodgepodge of garbage this isn't it so every test done by scientists throughout all of recorded history to prove axial rotation because we're spinning on our axis has proven the opposite that we're not spinning every test to measure curvature has proven that there is no curvature okay okay those are lies flat out lies there's no other way to describe them you don't need to perform an experiment to see the earth is spinning because we know the earth is spinning we don't need to do an experiment to see the curvature of the Earth because we know the curvature of the Earth. We figured it out thousands of years ago. Um, this is like the Mark Sargent thing about saying, oh, there was no there was no response. To say, the things he's saying, there's absolutely no other way of describing it. He is just lying. <clears throat> he is just lying to a biased interviewer who's just enabling everything he's saying. He loves an audience, does David Weiss. Um I'm going to crack on with this one a little bit more. I'm finding it hard, and I'm literally less than 15 minutes into an hour and a half thing. I don't know how these guys sleep at night. Probably on a large pile of money. Okay, so let's crack on. Let's see how much more I can tolerate before I have to call it a night. So we're supposedly in a system like this, okay? The Earth is spinning. This is the slowest motion, the spin of the Earth. Now, yes, it only goes around once per day, but if you're on the equator, you're moving a thousand miles an hour. You are dropping, if you're on the equator, you're dropping at like a mile a minute, okay? And maybe even a little faster. Relative to the size of the planet. Um, but it's interesting, um, and I'm quite surprised to hear him say that. On the equator, and again, we're not spinning, we're rotating, but he said on the equator, we're traveling at a thousand miles an hour relative to the size of the Earth. Absolutely fine. What about up here in England? We're not on the equator. Or, you know, North America, the North American Canadian border. I think, I looked it up, it's about 150 miles an hour in a straight line going around, you know, in relative to the rotation of the Earth. Uh, but it's still disingenuous. He says the word spinning, he's using a tiny model, um, and he's only talking about the equator of the Earth. Yeah, a mile a minute, it's absolutely fine. But because it's a constant velocity, we don't feel it. 
and spinning the earth sideways isn't doing you any favours. As I said earlier, we're not hanging from a thread in space. There is no up. Anybody coming to us from a certain direction could see South America at a inverse 45 degrees or 200, whatever, 235 degrees. Um, yes, disingenuous misdirection. Carry on. Okay. And uh, that's incredible. Imagine being on a merry-go-round going a thousand miles an hour. You can't even fathom what that would be like. Because if you're on a merry-go-round down a thousand miles an hour within the atmosphere, contrary to the constant velocity of the Earth, of course you're going to bloody feel it, you cretin. If you're a constant velocity on, on the Earth, you're not going to feel it because everything's moving the same speed as you, including the atmosphere. Right. So we're spinning. We're orbiting around the sun in a an elliptical path an elliptical orbit right and uh and if you look if you take um the the distance of our orbit and everything we're we're going at 66,616 miles an hour 666 a lot of that shows up in the heliocentric system oh finally it's all satan's doing again all these speeds are relative it doesn't matter if we're traveling at 666,666 miles an hour through space if the closest thing is a trillion miles away um just let me let me just finish right here with just okay. one thing just so people can get an idea of what this is of what these speeds are this is the hypersonic sled track just look it up on youtube so you can hear it it goes by it's shocking it's hard to fathom what this speed is but you have to believe that we are going 10 times faster than that around the sun and a hundred times faster than that chasing the sun. So you got this big globe earth with oceans and cruise ships and people and everything. It's going 10 times faster in a curved orbit and spiraling chasing the sun at a hundred times faster. Your brain short circuits, you're unable to process this information. Wow, pot kettle. I can understand that information and process that information just perfect, mate. It would appear that Dave's just showed his hand. There's only one person in this room, Max included. Hi, Max. Hello. <laughs> um, who can't get their head around that concept, and it ain't us. People say, you know, well, what, what about, um, what about, you know, why doesn't the water fall off the flat Earth, right? Because that's the biggest meme. That's the biggest meme out there. And uh, the answer is because we're not a disc floating in space. They want you to believe that, um, you know, if you look up flat Earth. You're going to come up with a uh, with a disc, kind of like this, right? And this is uh, John Avalon on CNN, you know, making fun of flat Earth, right? It's got it's like a turn up with you know dirt on the bottom. This is not flat Earth. Um, I do believe that earlier on you uh, were extolling the virtues of Mr. Mark Sargent, who actually said that that was indeed flat Earth, and he had a little cardboard cutout to prove it. So, are you certain this is what the Earth looks like? Pretty sure. Almost. I mean, there, there are some details to be worked out, sure, but the basic concept is sound. I, I say that we live in what I call the Antarctic Basin, right? What is that? Antarct so all of the oceans of the world are like a pond, right? A pond needs containment. The surface of a pond is flat. The surface of a lake is flat. The surface of the oceans at rest lie flat. No, they lie level. Um, held in place by gravity, pulling them down to the centre of mass of the planet. It's quite telling. I say that a lot, don't I? I think it's quite telling that you can hear the hesitation in his voice because he's created or he's reinforces this this absolutely bonkers concept of the flat Earth, or you know, it wasn't he didn't invent it, or whatever. But um, he's got to try and reinforce it and try and explain it to this person who is essentially. Uh, a sponge for the information he's given out. So he's he's telling, he, he's basically relating his entire theory or theories towards a layman, someone who has never heard of flat earth before, even though this woman is obviously just giving him an audience, so to speak. Uh, and the you know the hesitation the hesitation in his voice just shows, like, as I said in the last episode, he's got to constantly try to make sure he doesn't contradict something he said before. He's already just co contradicted himself 30 seconds ago by saying the round disc isn't flat, even though Mark Sargent says it is, and he says that Mark Sargent is a pretty good source of information regarding the flat earth. Bye bye, Mark Sargent, by the way, bye bye. You said you were gonna leave if somebody provided you proof of, you know, the curvature out of a plane window. Um, it's been done several times, so bye bye. It was nice knowing you, Mark. Bye bye. That's the shoreline of our world, right? So. That contains the water. That's called Antarctica. 
Antarctica is the highest land on earth. They don't teach you that in school. Okay. Makes sense. The shoreline of our world to stop the water from spilling over is Antarctica. Some people call it the ice wall. Okay. You call it the ice wall. Everyone else just calls it what it is. It's a continent on the very bottom of the planet. I was just about to say the ice wall. I mean, you're not allowed in this place. You are going to be shot on sight if you go past a certain point. So there's clearly something that's being hidden there. As far as some of the more nonsensical ideas about, you know, the guarding of the ice wall, so to speak, or the the hypothetical ice wall, being shot on sight really is one of the most stupid things I've ever heard. Um, As we've said before, and he has said before, you can go to Antarctica, you can, people work in Antarctica, not just on that little peninsula he was talking about, various spots <coughs> all around. That Lenin statue I spoke about last time was actually on top of, um, it was a, um, a Soviet research station, it was called something like the Impossible to Get to Place. It was a weird name, something like that, in, in ca- um, Camp Inhospitable. I'll look it up and I'll, I'll put it across the bottom here, sorry. Um, yeah, so there's more than one um, research station on the South Pole. It's not just on that peninsula. There's lots of them. And now you don't get shot if you get close to the South Pole. You're turned back if you're not invited. You can't just turn up on Antarctica. As we said before, mean temperatures over the year is minus 57 degrees. If you're going down there in a parka and a pair of sturdy boots, you're going to get turned around because if you don't, you're going to die. So the, the globalists out there will argue, anybody can go there. There's a hundred different companies that'll take you to this little tiny island at the tip of this peninsula, which is called Rothschild Island or Deception Island. It's next to Rothschild Island, okay? This this little tiny peninsula is bigger than some countries. It's not, don't, don't be fooled. This pink line represents 60 degrees south. No one is allowed to go beyond there. Okay, and then the, the, the globalists, you know, anti-flat earthers will go out there, oh, what is everybody linking elbows you know, all the way around, guarding, saying don't come in? No, there's eight different islands. There's eight islands. Let me just show you. Okay. Um, there's, eight, there's eight different islands um, that are all owned, they have military bases, they're all owned, uh, run by the crown. Oh, right, so it's all the fault of the king, is it? Jolly good. Um... I think I know where he's going with this, and brace yourself, because I think I might swear. Um, no one's allowed to go by. There's military bases. Remember the Falkland Islands War? Okay. What, what, that's weird. Off of South America, the, the little island. Why are they fighting over it? It's because this is where they have these bases. No, this is where I'm going to get angry. Um, because at this point in time, he is being a... Um, he knows nothing about the Falkland Wars. Um, It happened in 1982. I actually worked with somebody who was one of the first engineers into Port Stanley during during the conflict. Uh, Hi, Nick. I doubt very much if you're watching, but hi, Nick. Um, The Falkland War was was started because Argentina invaded the Falkland Islands because they claimed they had uh, territory over them. They call them Las Malvinas. They are the Falkland Islands. They've been part of the British uh, Isles since 1840. Something along those lines. They are very British. They had a recent referendum where the vast majority, and when I say they had a referendum, one person voted against uh, <laughs> the Falkland Islands remaining part of the British Isles, and I'm pretty sure that bloke was just having a laugh. What well, dickhead. Um, yeah, but in regards to the Falkland Wars, uh, uh, nearly a thousand people died, um, including three civilians during the Falkland War. Um, something like 2,000 people were injured, 2,000 soldiers and whatever were injured. It was a horrific conflict. Um, all conflicts are horrific. Um, and for this piece of shit to try and exploit those people who died, nearly a 1,000 people who died, nearly a 1,000 soldiers on both sides, cumulative, um, to say that it was protect this bloody stupid notion of there being armed sentries or armed bases all around the base of the world the you know the, around the, the edge of the world the, the non tentacle flat disc to protect this farcical idea is just fucking insulting to those people who died in the conflict. So David Vice, on this particular occasion, sir, you can go fuck yourself. And then there's a network of buoys, radar, you know, mesh buoys that go all the way around. No one is allowed to go there. If you try, you will be turned around. Now, you can go to Antarctica. We have flat earthers that have worked in Antarctica. We- hang on, hang on, hang on. 
I thought you just said you get shot on sight. You don't get turned around. And even though you get shot on sight, you can go to Antarctica. Which one is it? If you go from um, Santiago right here, and right here, this, you can have a base over here, you can have a base over here, you know? I know that there's this base, and I know there's another one off of, I think, um, somewhere off of Australia, but I don't know of any others, okay? He's got a map in front of him. He's citing his evidence. He said there's two maps. He said, oh, Santiago. He's just been talking about it. That's where the Falkland Islands are. Now he says one over the other end of the map. On that, his map, that's Australia. And I don't know where any of the others are. He's got eight bloody flags. Why is anybody listening to this absolute... And then the question is, what's out here? We don't know. We don't know what's out here, but that's... Yeah. We're not allowed to know. So I, I like to say, you know, what if the world is set up like this? Here we are. This ring is Antarctica. Now, again, to prove the Earth is flat, we don't need to speculate what's above higher than we can get or what's beyond the shoreline of Antarctica. But there's many stories from the 1800s and before of more land beyond there. Now, now I think I, I spoke about this in my previous um, video <clears throat> about Admiral Byrd who was the one who said that in his exploration of the South Pole um, there was more land past the South Pole that was about the size of North America. Now, as I said last time, that was true at the time. But remember that uh, Admiral Byrd turned around and came back. But this obviously has been conflated and, and taken completely out of context to say that past Antarctica there's more land. But that's ex completely not what they said at all. This realm, this level horizontal realm, and there was more land out here, Maria. What would you call somebody that lived on extra territory, extra terra? <laughs> yes. I'll tell you why this particular model doesn't make sense to me, Dave. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay. I'm, a, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. Okay. So, so yeah. when I look at what the word says, and it says God made two, uh, paraphrasing, two lights to govern the sky, one for day, one for night, right? So I think, okay, if the earth... I don't know that there's anything beyond the ice wall because there aren't more than there isn't more than one sun. That's where my thinking goes. Bizarrely, that's actually a very good point because this this double Earth, you know, outside the more land outside the Antarctic ice wall, um, is another one of their bonkers series that has no credibility. But she's actually made a very good point. Now let's see how how much well Dave can answer it because if there is that extra land, what's lighting it? Where's the illumination? Um, we've already spoken about the bizarre sun and moon that has no obvious means of projection or propulsion or suspension or propulsion, just floating in the sky and then spiralling in and spiralling out again. Um, but now there's extra land. What's illuminating that? Uh, does our sun do it? Where does it go? Again, more ideas. They're just literally throwing crap at a dartboard and seeing what sticks. That was probably the most nonsensical analogy I've ever come up with, but I kind of like it. Well, there could be, you know what? I can go either way. I'm literally 50-50, right? You can also interpret the, uh, the Bible that says, you know, the four corners of the earth. What if the earth was just talking about a bigger expanse, a bigger expanse with multiple ponds? And they're only talking about, you know, the, the sun that's in our area. I'll, let, let's go with you. Because neither of us know mm. and you want to go on scripture, I'm with you. Let's go on scripture. But the, here's how they hide it, okay? Here's how, let me... Uh, had it lost it for a second. Um, so here's how they would hide the, you know. It's about this point that all the students in the classroom suddenly realize the, the um, substitute teacher doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. Has only got really crap, crappily organized notes to go off and they lose all interest in anything he has to say. Is you just take it and you wrap the earth around a sphere and all of this land, let's say the dome was outside of that. Let's say the dome terminates. And there's a lot of evidence for that. Then they say, you know, this is Antarctica, okay? Right? So we took, we took that picture, this, right? And we cut it out right here. Let's say the dome, there's a dome, a biblical dome. It goes around out here. Cut this off, right? And then wrap it around a sphere we go so we so we take it and we just wrap it around a sphere and then we say you can't explore out here 
you can't explore this white frozen wasteland, right? Yes, that's what's This happened. is off limits. Well, as we've said before many times, no, it's not. You just need a lot of preparation and permission to go there. I'd say, Maria, you and I both want to know. We want to we want to see if you're if you're right, you know, if if we're if we're interpreting the Bible correctly, or maybe uh, maybe there's more lands. We want the right to explore as free human beings. So about the biblical interpretation, there's just one um, reference. I believe they call it the firmament, which they can't get their head around. The word firm is in there, which means solid or just stiff, for lack of a better expression. Yeah, firmament in the literal meaning of the word just means sky. It matters that we are being lied to about where we live, who we are, right? And uh, the, the truth, you know, that we are at the center of creation. That's the, that's the amazing part. They want us to believe that we're an insignificant speck flying through a, a, a random Big Bang universe. It was, at best, a distant, deluded God. And there we have it. I've said it before many times. These people literally think they're the center of the universe. In the grand scheme of things, Dave, when compared to the size of the universe we know, we're smaller than a moat of dust. You are not as important as you want to be. Well, you, you mentioned the... Um... The, the fact that the, some of the arguments against flat earth are that the water would just spill over the sides based on, you know, the disc. I don't find that any, I mean, the, the pictures that you've shown and, and the, the Arctic wall, if you will, around the earth um, under the model that you're suggesting it is, I find that more believable than a globe spinning at these insane speeds and the water not falling over the edges of that. Okay, I'm going to skip this bit because we're going over the same ground, saying the same tired old things. We're not doing ridiculous speeds. In this scale of the universe, we're actually going mind-numbingly slow. So think about this, and I always want to break. I, I like a frying pan is the best example. So you got a, a, an iron frying pan. It weighs like five pounds, mm. right? And, um, and so I got my hand here, and I want, to put, I want to push the frying pan. I got, I got the frying pan in my hand, and I want to push it up against this hand. Now, if I put one pound of upward pressure on there, can I get it to my hand? No, because the frying pan is five pounds. But if I put five pounds of pressure, I can hold I can hold that frying pan to the bottom of my hand, right? So I need five pounds of pressure to hold it there. If I had a 10-pound frying pan, I would need 10 pounds of pressure to hold it there, right? Makes sense. It's logical. You yes. with me? Yes. All right. On a globe, we have hundreds of trillions of tons of water on the bottom of a ball spinning adjacent to a scientifically impossible space vacuum. How much pounds of pressure would you need to hold trillions of tons of water to a ball trillions of tons trillions of tons wow i'm glad i carried on watching uh that's probably one of the most nonsensical things i've ever heard him say one it's not the bottom two there's nothing holding it up um gravity he's holding it down so to speak even though gravity doesn't pull down it draws towards the center of mass um and yeah like i said before the Planet Earth is not hanging from a string in space. But somehow we can, butterflies can fly, I can hold my arms up, I can jump. A summer breeze can blow the air left, right, up and down, but gravity is holding it from the all-powerful space vacuum. Uh, believe it or not, I'm actually only 26 minutes into this, so I'm going to have to probably abridge this. Um, he's already started repeating himself about gravity actually being, you know, it's actually an amazingly weak force. Um, it's also a, a gradient going up to the outer edges of the atmosphere, as we've spoken about before. Um, yeah, we can jump because gravity is not that strong. It just really does beg a belief that this guy, who is so well known in certain circles, is you know he's still listened to. Anybody? You know, why is anybody listening to this man at all? That last sentence alone should, should show you perfectly <clears throat> exactly how much the man knows about anything. Let me go Google, right? You Google, they're going to feed you garbage. You get nothing, right? It's like if you are relying on Google to learn about flat earth, you're going to just be like, you're just going to give up. Your brain's going to get tired or you're going to go, well, I couldn't find anything on flat earth. Well, that's kind of funny because if you Google the words flat earth, you get 650 million results. Thing is, and I think this is a little bit where uh, Dave's getting a little bit stuck and annoyed. Um, the Google algorithm generally brings up the most popular and most factual uh, results to the top. Uh, the ones with the most credibility, most sought after and verified. Um, let's have a quick look at the first few. Uh, 
Flat Earth is an archaic and scientifically disproven conception. Um, something about fighting Flat Earth theory. Uh, modern Flat Earth beliefs. Flat Earthers, what they believe and why. Are Flat Earthers being serious? The Flat Earth conspiracy is spreading around the globe. Ha 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 Looking for life on a Flat Earth. Flat Earth pizzas. Flat Earth theory model meaning and facts. Exploring the Flat Earth beliefs, identity and rationality. So basically David Vice was lying. Um, Colour me shocked. Yeah, Googling Flat Earth brings up nothing. Plenty there, mate. But this is where confirmation bias comes in. It's where you're looking for the results that feed your already preconceived narrative and not ones that contradict it. So you might be looking for the Google results that cement your own belief system and completely disregard the ones that don't, which is probably why you're not getting many results that feed into your little rabbit hole of nonsensicality. Uh, thing is, in this case, Google's working perfectly. It's just your mind isn't. You know, everything, everything I saw is completely ridiculous. And, uh, and that's the case. That's why I made this app. It's called the Flatter Sun, Moon and Zodiac Clock app. You have it, Maria? Yes, I bought that's it. True? Yes, absolutely. I yes, it's not for sale. You have to buy it. And if the rumors are true, it's a massive data mining operation that's stealing all your personal data. However, that could just be innuendo and hearsay. I have no verifiable sources to back that up. It's literally just what I've heard. But by Dave's own experience, that's more than enough to say it's absolutely true. You have it, Maria? Yes, I bought it. Yes, absolutely. I think it's a great resource. I mean, I haven't finished exploring yeah. it fully. I I just note that, you know, a lot of your resources are on there. You click a button, it comes up with educational videos. There's FAQs, uh, really, really yeah. good stuff. And I will say, Dave, that the one thing that made me want to explore this topic <clears throat> further was how difficult it is to find information about it. So when you go Google, right. Google's a perfect example. You Google COVID-19 vaccine uh, deaths and all you find is these fact-checking articles about how no one's dying from the COVID shot when we know that they are. Wow. Where did that come from? So we've gone from flat earth to talking about COVID deaths, which is complete a complete non sequitur to the whole subject of this. Oh, hang on a minute. She's the anti-vaccine COVID denier, isn't she? So now she's allowed Dave to come onto her show so now she can interject with his narrative to insert her own. Don't think I'll be paying much attention to this bit. Um, so, 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 so there's, sorry, if I can so, finish, the same thing happens with Flat Earth. You, you look at, you yeah. Google Flat Earth and you just find article after article of fact checkers and debunking. How very dare they check those facts? Well, who do they think they are? Well, hang on a minute now. Why are we putting so much effort into these search results to debunk this? Why, why isn't it an open conversation? Why are we working so hard to make sure that the information that is readily available is factually correct? Can't think why. Now it's actually flipping. Flat Earth is going to take over. And if you're not a Flat Earther, you're not, you're not in the cool gang. <laughs> Can we talk about where North is on the flat earth model first? So if we go to the images section right here and pull up the flat earth map, we'll go with this one, right? This is the Gleason's map. Oh yes, we know all about the Gleason's map, don't we? Because we spoke about this last time. Uh, the Gleason's map, as we know, is a projection from a sphere as evidenced by the patent that Mr. Gleason himself had to apply for and verify when he wanted to make his map a thing. Uh, the paper, patent is held at the US Patents Office and is easily searchable on Google, the amazingly verifiable fact-checking service. Um, but yeah, right down the bottom, which the Flat Earthers seem to hate, it does actually say specifically that the Gleason's map is a projection from a globe. So here's how it works. I got a magnet at the center right here. So I got a compass and the needle is pointing towards the center, okay? Compasses only work on a flat level surface, okay? And as I try to push this west, because west is right here, I have to keep turning because that needle always needs to point towards the center. Is it me or was he turning that compass with his finger as he turns it around his little flat map? I might be getting paranoid, but it really does look like he's actually turning it as he moves it. Maybe. But right here, I'm gonna try to go west and I'm gonna follow a straight line. I'm not gonna correct to the north. 
And as soon as I start moving, so there's west. That stick is pointing west from where I am right now. And as I go, watch, the needle just turned. I'm heading south, right? South is every direction away from north. So, you know, go. you can do this yourself. Get a magnet. That's north. Every direction away is south. So south is every one of these radial lines. Every line is heading south. Now, if I try to head south on a flat earth, I'm not going to end up over here. I'm just going to disappear. On a ball, you can go south and come back up. But guess what? Nobody has ever done it. Um, I did a little bit of research into this, and there's a very good reason why um, not a lot of people have flown directly over the South Pole. Um, people have got close, and they've turned around. The reason being, there's nothing there. Um, it's amazingly cold. The point is that if wherever you fly on the planet, FAA regulations or whatever regulations state that if you're going to set off on a plane journey, you have to be able to get to a safe point of landing within a certain distance. Uh, you know, have a mechanical failure, fuel line, any kind of issue. Um, if you're flying out the surface, because it's so cold and inho inhospitable, it is not recommended that anybody tries to fly directly up below so i dare say somebody has i couldn't find it myself on good old trusty google again there's no point doing it if there's no point doing it if so if you were to take off the summermost airport say santiago and try to fly over the south pole if you did so after the south pole from that point as admiral bird said there's an area the size of north america and if you get into trouble there you are screwed you have to be out like i said before you have to be able to put within reach within reason of a safe landing area. There isn't one. You're literally flying over the continental United States. And it's minus, and if it's minus 57 degrees on the peninsula, it's minus God knows what at the South Pole. And as I've said before, you get in trouble to, there, there's no rescue mission. And quite frankly, the opinion of a flat earther isn't reason enough for anybody to risk their lives just to satisfy your curiosity. Every time they try to do it, they end up going south, and then they turn around and they come back. Okay? So you're saying that, no that, one yeah. has ever managed to to, to travel Circum south around, circumvent the earth, um, not even explorers? No, nobody has ever done it. The most recent one was a, uh, a guy, um, it was called Spider Tracks, and we're like, this guy's gonna do it, we could track him live. And he basically went, he went from, um, you know, the North Pole went out to uh, um, Alaska, California, I believe Hawaii, these islands here, up over here, then down to South America. Then he went to the alleged South Pole. Then they said, oh, the weather's too bad. We have to turn around. And they came back up through Brazil, and they came up here and back up to the North Pole. And we're like, well, they didn't do it. Guinness Book gave them the world record for circum southern circumnavigation. Okay, I did a little bit of research into this. There is no Guinness World Record for southern solo uh, circumnavigation that's a really hard thing to say when you've had too many high squashes um the closest i could find is a guy called travis ludlow who quite recently flew around the world on his own uh it was quite a bit of a whippersnapper he was about 21 he was 20 at the time sorry um yeah and the route he took was absolutely nothing whatsoever like the thing that david rice brought up in the map there I don't know what he was talking about, but that isn't so like circumnavigation. Um, and I'm always talking about flying close to the South Pole, turn around and come back. And if you're going to circumnavigate the Antarctica, you wouldn't need to go to the South Pole. You just need to fly around it. So absolutely nothing he said made any sense. So as I say, he's either completely ignorant or is a liar. Why not both? Okay. And they just had another one recently that well, happened. Well, even on a globe and Earth, they didn't circumvent South. They, they didn't circumnavigate, right? They, they had another one that, um, it, they, they had another one. I think it went from like South, from South Africa. It went down. And now if we're looking at this on a globe, it went down and it just went like this and went over here and then it went back up. Right. Didn't, they didn't cut across that way. Right. And so on a, on a flat earth, right. They went from South America. They just skirted over here and then they came over here. That's it. That's all they did. Right. Nobody goes from Santiago and pops up in New Zealand or Australia. No one's ever done it. Apart from LATAM flights, LA 800, which regularly goes exactly from Santiago in Chile to Auckland in New Zealand. They do it once a day. 
Uh, so this flight QFA 27 from Qantas, which goes directly from Santiago, Chile to Sydney Airport. So that was a lie. And he knows it's a lie because he's been doing this for so long. He is so long in the tooth and he's so well established in the world of flat earthers. He has been corrected and provided with verifiable sources on so many occasions that it is now complete willful ignorance. He knows what he's saying is wrong, but he has his narrative to stick to and his bullshit to pedal. So yeah, he's lying. Um, there are flights going from Santiago to Australia, Santiago to New Zealand. There were flights between uh, Santiago and uh, South Africa as well. Um, there aren't any at the moment. I was gonna bring some up live on flightradar24.com, but there aren't any, but you can go for the past history. Uh, yeah, so there are flights that go in the Southern Hemisphere on a regular basis, and they do indeed uh, dip quite low to the Arctic Circle, but it only looks that way on the Mercator map. Here's something else I'm quickly going to show you. Okay, so this is Google Earth, uh, Google Maps rather, maps.google.com. Um, Google Earth is a separate entity, um, even though it's run by Google. I prefer this now because uh, it's browser based and there's a lot more. Um, used to be quite unwieldy but they have improved it but anyway anyway on to the point so as Dave was saying he says that there are no flights between Auckland and New Zealand I can prove that he hasn't I can show you the flight data and the flight telemetry of several flights that do this trip on a daily basis now he says that they the flights tend to travel quite low to the Arctic Circle then come back up again there's a reason for that now there's a measure option on Google uh, so what I'm gonna do I'm gonna oh god what the hell happened there that wasn't me honestly it might be this mouse Right, so if I just click somewhere near Auckland, okay, that's my start point. I'm going to drag it over. I'm going to find Santiago. Uh, where's Santiago? Santiago, there we go. There you go. Now, as you can see, dips right down, comes back up again. Now, now, why is that? I hear you cry. Very simple reason. If you go down here and hit Globe View, that's basically a straight line, and it's part of the Great Circle. It's the same as you know any other circle navigation, you know any other navigation line. When you plot a map on the Mercator map, it makes it look vastly different. Here's a fun one. There are flights that m regularly go from Doha in the United Arab Emirates, which I think is here, and they go to San Francisco. Okay, San Francisco. I'm just going to put randomly there and look at that flight path. Well, it actually goes off the top of the browser to the point I can't actually drag the screen down. But yeah, that really looks quite remarkable. And if you were to go, you know, base your things on a Mercator map, it would look a little bit bizarre. But hit the globe view, it's just another straight line. Straight over the top. And that does, in fact, go pretty close to the North Pole. Um, again, flat earthers would say, well, that's just evidence. But they always ignore the contradictory information um, that doesn't fit their narrative. Again, so if I go from Santiago to Cape Town, nice straight line there, take it off the globe view, put the Mercator, and it looks like a wonky line. It goes down and comes back up on a Mercator map because a Mercator map is the worst possible map to use when you're trying to see what the Earth actually looks like. Thank you, Google. Good night. Right, okie dokie. So let's carry on. So again, Dave knows nothing about flight paths because he obviously he's looking at the Mercator map being a tra true representation of the planet when it most bloody clearly isn't. And he seems to com be completely ignorant of any kind of flight path that happens south of the equator. Oh, and also in regards to the flight time, it's only about 10 hours. Um, and actually, obviously they're verifiable. If that was to be on a flat earth, they'd have to go the very long way around to follow that flight path and you're probably talking three days well, okay. talk, talk to us then about flight paths. Right. Right. So flight paths are are, are, are flight paths are the, are the death blow to the ball. Okay. So you got your equator over the middle. Okay. And every airport above the equator is a northern airport. And every airport below the equator is a southern airport. Right. Very simple. I'm just explaining, you know, globe reality. Okay. It's an amazing leap of logic there. Northern airports in the Northern Hemisphere and Southern airports in the Southern Hemisphere. I think this man's actually smarter than I gave him credit for. So if you put all of the airports that are in the North in a hat and you picked out two of them randomly, any combination of any two, 
a flight from one to the other will never ever cross the equator, right? There's just no reason to cross the equator because you're going from a northern location, right? Going from a northern location to another northern location. It doesn't matter. You would never go below the equator because that would be a longer flight. And guess what? No flight routes do that. No flight routes in the north from a north airport to a northern destination um, ever, ever cross below the equator. Yeah, why would they need to? If you are in the northern hemisphere and you're going to somewhere else in the northern hemisphere, of course you're not going to go south of the equator. Why would you possibly need to? If you're talking about a single flight, yeah, if you're talking about a stopover, that's a completely different beast altogether. So the same should be true on a ball because there has to be symmetry. You should never have to go, <clears throat> excuse me, from a southern location into the north, but many, many, many times, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, many, many times that happens. Here's a, here's a women's um, soccer team that was going from, from uh, Brazil to um, Sydney and they stopped in Tahiti, okay, right? So on a, on a globe, it went, they went all the way up here and then all the way down here. Like, why didn't they just cut across right by Antarctica? And, you know, there's Easter Island out here they could stop at if there's an emergency, right? Why didn't they go across? The reason they didn't go right across is because generally um, there are no uh, commercial flights whatsoever on the planet run by any commercial plane um, company that go directly from Brazil to Sydney. It's too far. Um, the flight the plane, the plane he's actually talking about was a specific charter flight. Quite, re it was actually quite recently. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased he's, um, he's doing some recent research, not sticking on to old, uh, old ideas. But he's still getting it completely wrong. Yeah, like I say, it was a, a recent charter flight for a soccer team to come back to, uh, from Brazil to um, Sydney. <clears throat> now the thing is, I did look into it. They could have done the full trip in one go. But it's something like a 13 to 14 hour flight solid if you're, going to go, if you're going to go straight there. Nobody wants to do that. So they stopped in Tahiti to refuel, take on more provisions, and then carry on the flight. I don't know what, how long the stopover was. But yeah, everybody needs a break, including pilots. Um, but like I say, there are no flights that go directly from Brazil to Sydney. And this was a specific charter flight where they landed in Tahiti to take a break. Now, here's what the trip looked like on a flat earth. Now, Someone with a that's actually actually thinking they'd be like, well, why don't they stop in America or 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 Canada and continue? Because that's a real straight line on the flat Earth map. And the answer is because America and Canada require them to have U.S. or Canadian passports for every single team member, and they don't all have them. No, that's a complete lie. You have your own passports. So if you're not indigenous to a country, you don't have to have U.S. or Canadian uh, passports if you're just landing there for a stopover. That's an utter pile of garbage and um we'll see uh we'll we'll see some some good stuff this is uh this is this is uh this is good so here we go um let's start with this substitute teachers losing the pupils again it's halfway so the equator is halfway in between the center and the outer part so let me so let me um let me show people how how that works sure um so, I don't mean to interrupt your flight path presentation, but I no, think no, it's no, important. No, 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 that's okay. That's all right. I, pe people say that I'm very, uh, I, I'm scatterbrained sometimes. It's because we're, we're talking about so many different things. There's so many different ways to go. Yeah, and you don't want to contradict yourself. Here is, um, I'm going to make this a little bigger so people can see it. Oops. Um, how come that's not working? Um, app full screen. There we go. All right. So you have a uh, you have the inner yellow line that's near the that the sun right now the sun is over almost over that inner yellow line and that's the tropic of cancer can you see that yes okay and then the outer yellow line is the tropic of capricorn right, right? we've all heard that and then that's there's there's a very thin orange line halfway a red line halfway in between them and that's the equator okay right now the sun travels six months in to June 21st, where it's over the Tropic of Cancer. Well, we're past June 21st. It's already moving its way out. I'm going to jump forward July, August, September, October. This appears to be showing the sun um, in its path around the flat Earth uh, per month rather than per day. So while the clocks are spinning really, really fast, 
apparently the sun doesn't move on for six months. November and December. So in December, it's out over the Tropic of Capricorn and Australia has their summer in December. That's the height of their summer. You know why? Because the sun is directly above them. This actually makes less sense than the uh, magical um, self-propelled, self-suspended sun and moon in the flat earth sky. Okay, they're having their summer, but he, me here in Connecticut, I'm having my winter because guess what? The sun is far away from me. There's so much contradictory information on this one single map, it's discrediting itself, it's debunking itself because absolutely nothing about it makes any sense whatsoever. Apart from the fact the area the sun is illuminating is magically going around a dark area on the other side of the North Pole. How does that work? It would be the other way around, surely. Um, there we are, May, June. So in June, it's in and it's higher and it's warmer. And that's how seasons work. That's how the sun works. Um, and that's how it goes around. It just circles around. You look like you have a question. I was just, because I was just about to ask you about seasons. So uh, my, my understanding previous to what you just showed was that the sun kind of doesn't move. It's always going in the same circle in the flat earth model. But you're saying it does. And that's why we have seasons. Her brain is melting. You can see in her face, she cannot make sense of anything that Dave is saying. Now, I'm making no um, attestations about her intelligence. Um, the, some of the crap she comes out with on other videos would m lead me to believe she is a desperately unintelligent woman who's got a smart camera in her home um, because of the, some of the crap she comes out with. Yeah, but yeah, you can see she's really struggling with this. I think it's important to consider things that just don't make sense. If we're talking about stars that are billions of light years away and we can see their light, and yet um, I've seen you show, for example, the view of the moon, um, or was it the sun, from other planets, it, it simply doesn't make sense. If you actually think about it, the problem is people have a hard time understanding the sizes and distances and brightnesses. Let's talk about flight paths, then we'll talk about star brightness. Let's is do that, that. Cool? Sure. Okay. So here's a, um, a, a shot from Auckland. Uh, it goes all the way up to Los Angeles and then down to Lima, Peru. Now, everybody in Auckland, they don't want to go to Los Angeles. They want to go to Lima, Peru, but they go all the way up there. They cross the equator. Here's the equator right here, this uh, black, little black line there. But when we look at that trip on a flat earth, look at that, it's a straight line. Again, this is colossal cherry picking. There are flights that go from um, Lima, Peru to Auckland or Auckland to Lima, Peru via Chile. There are no direct flights going from Lima direct to Auckland for the same reason there's no flights going from Brazil or Brasilia to Sydney. It's too long. Um, this flight path he's particularly cherry picked for this specific reason, our wager is probably a flight company that is based in and around North America, probably American Airlines or something along those lines. Um, they do this, they, they'll choose a specific, like Qantas is a good one they use sometimes. Um, yeah, there are direct flights from Chile to Auckland um, for the purposes of going from Peru to Auckland, just with one stopover. There are no direct flights. The flight path he specifically chosen for this demonstration is an extreme version of a stopover that is not in keeping what everyone else does every day of the week. I will continue, um, probably not with this because it's gotten to the point now that, um, as I said before, he knows he's wrong. He knows he's lying. And the expression on this young woman's face, I'll say young, she's probably older than me, just like a load of makeup. Sorry, that was unnecessarily spiteful. Um, you can see in her face, she's not buying any of it, but she wants this guy on her YouTube channel to get her numbers up. So it's mutually beneficial derp. MBD. No, that's not a very good acronym, is it? Okay, thanks very much for watching. I will put a cap on that one. As I said at the start of the video, there's only so much of that you can take before it utterly befuddles your brain. What's remarkable is the fact that he, David Rice has been doing this for so long, He's at, he's and he is, he must be so deep down his own rabbit hole, there's no way of digging it out, so he's just, he's just so utterly personally convinced that everything he says is true. 
It's quite remarkable and amazingly sad at the same time. And again, people keep giving audiences. People keep on inviting you onto their podcasts and shows and, you know, Tim Pot Conspiracy Theory little YouTube channels to further their own numbers and what have you because he is a well-known name for all the wrong reasons. But I will leave it at that. Um, thank you very much for watching. Please like and subscribe. I will see you next time I see you. Bye-bye.